Welcome to my moth video. Today I'm going to share an adventure from Pakistan. Pakistan is a country with, as of 2020, over 233 million people situated in South Asia, bordering the Middle East. Despite the country having so many millions of people, we rarely hear about the cool environment of Pakistan that is underrated and has beautiful nature and fascinating animals. What does the landscape of Pakistan look like? A lot of people will assume it is desert-like or arid. In some parts of the country this is actually true. But did you know Pakistan can also be lush and green? Yes, it's true. Pakistan lies in the temperate zone. The climate is generally arid, characterized by hot summers and cool or cold winters, and wide variations between extremes of temperature at given locations. There is little rainfall. These generalizations should not, however, obscure the distinct differences existing among particular locations. For example, the coastal area along the Arabian Sea is usually warm, whereas the frozen, snow-covered ridges of the Karakoram range and other mountains of the far north are so cold, year-round, that they are only accessible by, by world-class climbers for a few weeks in May and June of each year only. Pakistan has four seasons, a cool and dry winter from December through February, a hot, dry spring from March through May, the summer rainy season or southwest monsoon period from June through September and the retreating monsoon period of October and November. The onset and duration of these seasons vary somewhat according to location. The climate in the capital city of Islamabad varies from an average daily low of 2 degrees Celsius in January to an average daily high of 40 degrees Celsius in June. Half of the annual rainfall occurs in July and August, averaging about 255 mm in each of those two months. The remainder of the year has significantly less rain, amounting to about 50 mm per month. Hailstorms are common in the spring. Let's talk about a province of Pakistan where this episode starts. Geber Pakhtunkhwa. I hope I pronounced it correctly, it's difficult for me as a foreigner. Geber Pakhtunkhwa is one of the coldest regions in Pakistan with an average daily high temperature of only 30 degrees centigrade. Well, to me as a Dutchman that's very hot, but for Pakistan, an average daily temperature, that's cold. Several months of the year it is warm to hot at temperatures continuously above above 25 degrees centigrade, sometimes up to 40 degrees. The province has a varied landscape ranging from rugged mountains, valleys, hills and dense agricultural farms. This picture was taken by the researchers who helped me study this moth. That's right, you're actually seeing photos taken from the field where this episode begins. You see, I used some of my own personal money that I raised online to help fund a research expedition to Pakistan, where a few entomologists, who prefer to remain unnamed on YouTube, started an expedition to look at the local moths. I thought the idea was so good, I donated some of my own YouTube money to them to support their scientific quest. This is the region in Geber Pakhtunkhwa where they trapped the moths and in fact found the species that I will show you today. This part of Pakistan is actually part of the Himalayas. That's right, the Himalaya mountain ranges also extend into Pakistan and they have some very interesting local flora and fauna. It was right here that the entomologist I was in contact with would moth trap. And amazing moths they did find, like this Caligula lindia that I received eggs of. A species that also flies in this part of Pakistan and is not very rare in this place. It's true, behind the scenes I have been raising this species, but the cocoons take a year to hatch since it has only one generation a year unfortunately. So you will need some patience until next year if you want to be able to see these guys. 
These are just some of the moths that were found in this research expedition. Here are many kinds of nuts and spices from a shop in Pakistan. It looks pretty amazing if you ask me. I wonder what they taste like. And though I could show more pictures from this expedition, of course, that's not what my video is about. But it's about what the entomologist managed to find here. So a few days and many impressions later, the moth trap was activated. And our story begins. Many species of moths were found, but this video only focuses on a single one of them. The emerald tiger moth, Calimorpha principalis. This picture is a picture of the actual moth trap that caught the parents of the moths that you will see today in my video. It turns out that the Calimorpha principalis was actually one of the most common local species that came to the lights in high frequencies. The life history of this moth is known to science, but despite that, not many good pictures or descriptions exist of the early life stages. So maybe it could be valuable to breed them, photograph them and film them so that we learn a little bit more of these rarely studied insects. The scientists had taken eggs of these moths to have an early look at them in captivity. Since I co-funded their trip, they also sent me some of the baby caterpillars to raise in captivity. Not many people know this, but my channel sometimes collaborates with actual entomologists working in the field worldwide. And I use the funds that I raise online to sponsor scientists that study moths. That's how I hope that my channel will make a positive impact on entomology. The bigger my channel grows, the more positive my influence will be on science. This story begins as usual with tiny caterpillars that are provided to me by the entomologists that I had sponsored. I kept them in plastic boxes, covered with netting that provided them ventilation. I figured that since their habitat was somewhat dry, I shouldn't let the humidity build up too hard in their rearing containers. I made sure to add fresh leaf every few days, and I let the old leaf litter accumulate, because these caterpillars seem to like uh, to hide during the day and come out to feed at night. After a while it was time to upgrade them to a bigger box. The caterpillars had grown larger and so their surroundings needed a little upgrade. I used my usual aerated plastic box, the same one I more or less always use when dealing with species that need a dry ventilated environment, but also don't thrive in cages. I threw in some empty kitchen rolls so that they can hide in, during the, in them during the day and I threw in some dandelion leaves and added an empty soda can with bramble in it so the caterpillars could feed from it. These caterpillars really seem to like their new environment. One observation I found interesting is that, uh, how they would hide during the day. The kitchen rolls I added was full of caterpillars during the day and they only crawled out to feed at night or so it seems. The caterpillars did seem to be strongly nocturnal and avoided feeding during the day. This video is a bit short, but raising them took between 4 to 6 months time, which is a long time. I am not the first person to ever raise them, unfortunately, but I am actually among the first. Their early life stages have been described to science years and years before I made this video, but still I do think that less than a dozen entomologists have witnessed the life cycle of this insect. That makes this footage pretty unique because pictures and videos of the early life stages of these insects are very hard to get. They seem to develop quite well on the bramble and eventually, many months later, I uh, did find a pupa. The pupa, I stored them in a plastic box that had the edges covered with toilet paper to give the emerging moths a little bit more grip. While the first pupa were safely developing, the caterpillars continue to grow. Raising tiger moths is a bit different from other species of moths. They usually prefer herbaceous plants and are more often than not surface dwellers that forage on the diversity of plants. In this case, the same appeared to be true. Every day was harvesting more and more pupa, and my collection of pupa quickly grew. 
Thankfully the pupal stage of this insect does not last long, about 3 to 4 weeks time. Here they are, finally the moths are hatching. The adults of the Calimorpha principalis are here. These moths are also called the emerald tiger moths and it's easy to see why. They have a dark blue and green metallic sheen with splendid yellow spots on their forewings. Truly they are like living gems. Interestingly these moths seem active at night but also in the evening. This species has been recorded in Afghanistan, Pakistan, a small part of India, Nepal and China. Here the moths are usually found in the mountains on higher altitudes. There are several geographic subspecies with a slightly different appearance. At night these moths can be abundant in light traps, which suggests that they are locally quite abundant during their flight season. In captivity the larvae demonstrated a high degree of polyphagia, so in the wild they likely feed on several types of herbaceous shrubs. Although it's unclear to me which ones they actually prefer in the wild. These moths require feeding with sugar water. Tiger moths from the genus Calimorpha have a proboscis and are a feeding type that visit flowers in the wild to drink from the nectar. The pupation of the larva seemed quite sporadic to me with larva pupating and adults hatching from the pupa over a span of several months, instead of all of them at the same time. Interestingly, if these moths are forcefully grabbed, they can squeak loudly. Can you hear it? I apologize for manhandling the insect. No insects were harmed since I am quite experienced with them. But did you hear the squeaking noise? I wonder what function it serves. Is it possible they have auditive aposematism that warns bats of their potential toxicity like some tiger moths do? Or does it disturb echolocation perhaps? Who knows? Also interesting to note is that the droplets the insect secretes, which presumably contains toxins or bitter tasting chemicals, to discourage predators. I fed the moths as often as I could with a sugar water mix that kept them alive and healthy for several weeks. However, one thing is notable. I failed to pair these moths. This seems to be a common trend whenever I breed tiger moths and in some cases it results in infertile adults that do not reproduce. And I wonder why that is. If any tiger moth experts are watching my videos right now, what is your opinion? Personally, I sus suspect that certain dietary compounds were missing in their diet. Despite being polyphagous, the specific dietary requirements of a caterpillar can be complicated. Sometimes even polyphagous species need to supplement their diet with specific plants in order to develop normally. Those who follow my channel will know I had this problem with my balaka moth that I recently uh, bred and filmed in a Moth Cycles episode. It's a pretty frustrating problem since it would be better if I was able to reproduce rare species like these instead of just raising them. But it does encourage me to increase my expertise with tiger moths. Thank you for watching my video about Pakistani tiger moths. My YouTube channel supports entomologists working in the field and the study of moths as a science. Please consider donating or contributing to my channel since YouTube permanently demonetized me and I struggle to find the free time to make so many YouTube videos. See you later! Ladies and gentlemen, the moths are dead now. Here are some of the dead ones. Can you see it? I put them here. As you can see, there are so many of them. I think in total I managed to raise, well, I think about 30 or 40 of these guys. Although they, uh, they, never, they never hatched really around the same time, so I didn't really have many at the same time in my video. As you can see, I uh, have a good amount of individuals. So in that regard, the rearing was a success. But this episode doesn't end on a 100% happy note. Because...
I failed to get a pairing. That's annoying. And this seems to be a common trend whenever I raise Tiger Moss, the Arctine. Maybe those of you who um, are subscribed to my channel and have seen uh, the episode of Moth Cycles, where I breed Balakra. Yes, it's these pretty tiger moths that you're currently looking at. Maybe you remember them. I got eggs of them from Africa. I raised like uh, 30 of them to moths. And not a single one was interested in pairing. No, all of the males ignored the females. And the same happens with this species. Ah. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, if there's people who are experienced with breeding tiger moths who are watching this video, maybe they can leave for me in the comments a tip. Because uh, uh, I, I am experienced with raising them, but not that much. Uh, I mainly breed the Saturnidae, the silk moths, and I'm trying to get deeper into tiger moths. So far, some of it has been successful. But I also stumble upon weird problems like this. Uh, one theory I had is that they are missing specific dietary compounds. I found out that some species of tiger moths have uh, pheromone precursor compounds, which are basically certain compounds such as alkaloids that they require to have in their diet. And uh, when they develop into adulthood, they basically biosynthesize these alkaloids into pheromones, which is why they are called precursor compounds, because they are the chemical precursor of the pheromone substance they use to attract a partner. But I also found that some species like the Calimorphinae, which is this Calimorpha, don't have pheromone precursor compounds. So now I'm confused. So why don't they pair? Maybe my theory about uh, producing sterile adults is not 100% correct. But then again, it keeps happening. It would be better if I could pair the moths and have another generation that I can share with my friends, with other entomologists who study moths, like I can send them some eggs or some caterpillars so the species doesn't go extinct in captivity, but that's what happened. Uh, overall, I'm still very happy with the result. Because uh, I, I, I think there is less than, teen pe people, less than 10 people on the planet Earth that have ever witnessed the life cycle of this insect up close. It's originally it's a very common insect, so that's weird. But it flies in countries where not many entomologists visit, like Nepal, Pakistan, uh, China, Afghanistan. Difficult places to do field work. Certainly without the proper permits and permissions. Uh, places like Pakistan, Afghanistan, also not uh, the safest countries to travel to. I mean, just would you... You have to be a special type of crazy to do that, just for a few months. Thank you guys for watching. Like the video, subscribe and consider donating. Why? Aha, my channel is 100% and completely demonetized by YouTube themselves. Whenever people click on my videos, I do not make a single dollar. Unlike other YouTubers who get paid to make videos through ad revenue. I don't get any of that. I am basically doing this for free. But thankfully, my loyal fans and loyal subscribers send me donations sometimes. It's pathetic to ask for donations. I think it's humiliating. But I have to for the survival of my channel. Because YouTube is not supporting me, I am forced to ask strangers for handouts. My channel supports entomology, my channel supports the study of insects, and as you could have seen in the start of this episode, my channel even supports scientists who work in the field, because sometimes I use the money that I make online to sponsor research operations in other countries. Isn't that a win-win situation? It definitely is. Thank you guys for watching. Hope to see you next video. Bye bye.